Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, I hope you're doing really well in this moment in time and that whenever and wherever you are, wherever you happen to be, whenever you are listening to this recording, that you are not comparing yourself spiritually to everyone else around you. And what I mean by that is, sure, you could look around you and say, well, they're not spiritually awake, they're asleep, I must be more advanced than them. That's one one, one part of this. Because that doesn't mean you're more advanced, it just means you're awake, right? Um, you might be sitting in the same living room as a spiritual ascended master who is still sleeping. And when they wake up tomorrow, they might be extremely advanced. <laughs> I mean, the sleeping giants are still giants. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just because they're asleep doesn't mean they're not giants. Or, uh, and conversely, and this is more likely to be this scenario, if you are comparing yourself to others on a spiritual level, that you're not assuming that you're like less than other people. And that you're not assuming that you have eons and light years ahead of you to go, whereas pretty much everyone else is a lot more advanced than you. Especially if you're spiritually newly awake. And as a newly awakened one, you don't have the knowledge. You know, just because you don't know what chakras are or what your aura is or how to astral project or whatever doesn't mean that you're not spiritually advanced. It just means that you don't remember the information that you've already had in your bag of tricks, Felix. (laughs) You've already known this stuff on some level, either in another life or when you were in the place, the life between lives, the heaven, I call it, the other side, a lot of people call it. But you can wake up and not have any information. You forgot what was in the books, even though you already have your degree. (laughs) But this happens, this happens, you know. So I don't want you to compare yourself to other people, you know, and, and feel like you're better than or less than anyone else. Because, um... Spiritual masters throughout the ages have said that you truly do not know the spiritual advancement of another and comparing yourself. It's just a useless activity, you know, comparing your knowledge versus someone else's like you might have all the knowledge in the world. Maybe you studied for 15 years doesn't make you spiritually advanced. If you have not done the spiritual work and you have not um, accepted the spiritual growth, if you have not looked deeply at yourself in psychological and emotional ways and healed yourself and learned how to relate to others and how to be very intimate with others, I don't mean sexually, I mean being your truest, best most authentic self. If you're not able to admit who you are, if you're not able to admit when you've made a mistake, you know, you might know everything there is to know about auras. You might have all the books that money can buy at Barnes and Noble. (laughs) Um, Just because you have all the knowledge, the book learning down doesn't mean that you have all of the advancement together, right? And conversely, just because you're super good with people, you know, but you don't know anything about spiritual stuff, doesn't mean that you're not advanced spiritually. You know, we're, um, we're born where we are either most needed or will learn the most. And if you're spiritually advanced, you're going to be the one helping raise up all of those people around you, which is quite humbling. 
if you're in that position. And if you are pretty much there to learn from those around you, that could be quite frustrating, actually. You know, if they're frustrated with you and then you get frustrated with you. You know, imagine when Yoda was trying to tell uh, Luke how to raise the ship and and Luke's like, but it's so heavy, it's so big, there you know, it's just so much mass to it. And Yoda's just like, Oh my god, like all that's an illusion. You know? Not the exact uh dialogue in the movie, but you guys know what I mean. So it's kind of a slippery slope. It's dangerous to compare yourself spiritually to others. And that's another thing. Um, even though I get really irritated with a lot of the things that I've heard come out of people's mouths based on their religion, most usually Christianity, um, it always bothers me. You know, like I was watching a show earlier where this woman was having a hard time with the man because he was bisexual and she wanted to be with him in a relationship and then found that out about him when he admitted it. And she was just like, I've got to pray on it. And he's just like, Oh my God, you're being ignorant because you know, I have the ability, the unique ability to love people based on their heart, not based on what kind of body they've got. You know, it's kind of an advanced position and, and you're like judging me and acting like this is such a big deal when it's really, it's just a part of me. It's not the biggest part of me. It's just, you know, part of me. So it was just like, it wasn't going to work out. Right. But, um, uh, I want you guys just to feel that you're on the correct path for you and you are at the current level of, of advancement you are at. And I don't want you to judge yourself and think like you're better than everyone else or bigger than they are or more advanced. And you got to just go and take up the slack for everyone because everyone has their own, um, I don't want to say cross to bear because that's too religious, but everybody has their own road to walk. You know, their own row to hoe. (laughs) You know, everyone has their own little bit and piece that they have to do. You know, like, I don't know, like, uh, what? how can I think? Like, if you're going to build a garden and everyone on earth, our only job is to build a garden and we all have to grow, you know, tomatoes and eggplants and, um, potatoes and onions and garlic and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, you know, um, and you can't look at anyone else's garden. You can't see into their garden. You can only see what they talk about. So they're only talking about tilling the soil. You don't know if all the vegetables already grown there or if they only have garlic or if they just have weeds because the fence is so high. You can't see over there. All you know is that we're all farmers. (laughs) We're all doing the same thing, you know, so you can't judge yourself based on not being able to see anyone else. And you also, what if you can't see your own garden? It's nighttime, you know, and it seems like we're in the spiritual dark quite a bit. Um, as far as everyone else and ourselves and the only people we know for sure to be spiritual masters are the ones we read about with the stories where they are able to do the neat parlor tricks like raising the dead or raising themselves from the dead or water into wine or putting the hand on a train. The train goes and it can't go because their hand is on the train, as in the case with Paramahansa Yogananda. Or the saint who told her mother-in-law, um, her mother-in-law was, it's like a really weird and petty story. The mother-in-law was being very petty and told her she didn't, um, she wasn't cleaning the dishes well enough and that she wasn't able to, um, cook very well for her husband. And she was kind of disparaging her and telling her she's not a very good wife. And she said, well, I tell you what, I'm never ever going to eat again 
and therefore you can do all of the dishes and you can do all of the cooking. In fact, I'm not even going to live in the house. So there you go. You don't like me? Good. I'm leaving. I'll still remain married to your son who I love and have a relationship with him. But as far as you and I, we're not going to live in the same house together anymore. And that's in India, you know, where um, families do kind of intermingle like a lot more um, than is comfortable for some people. But she was the saint that Paramahansa Yogananda went in and he interviewed you can read the story in Autobiography of a Yogi. I can't remember. I mean, literally, it was 22 years ago I read the book. So, um, but this is how I remember it anyway. And she went outside and she prayed, um, either strike me down dead or give me the ability, God, please, to not have to ever eat again. And she didn't eat. And by the time Yo- Yogananda had met her, She hadn't eaten in years, years and years and years. Not one morsel. She would drink water and she would meditate and that was it. And she'd sit in the sun and that was it. You know, and she laid outside on a little mat, like a little, um, like a tatami mat or something like a grass mat. And she had like a little shelter she made for herself in the backyard. And she just didn't care. All she did was she spent her whole days meditating in silence. That was her thing. And probably she advanced like super, super far along. But there was another story in Autobiography of a Yogi about a man who was a prisoner and he had done something really, really bad. And he felt bad about himself and people around him were afraid of him. They didn't like him. You know, just a a criminal that had done something terrible. I don't think he was a murderer, but he might have been. And all of a sudden, one day he just got like zapped (laughs) you know like the hand of God touched him and in a heartbeat he was enlightened and when he became enlightened he then knew the error of his ways he his whole personality changed and everything from then on was easy he didn't care if he was in prison it didn't matter where he was he was at because all he focused on from that point forward was the love of God loving God so I don't want you to compare yourself to other people you know, in the way that you think that you're not as good spiritually or that you're better spiritually because neither one of them is useful to you. You're on a spiritual path. You're advancing. Chances are you're pretty far along the path if you're listening to this show. Um, but you still don't know where you are. Like for me, I don't know where I am even. I know that I'm more advanced than I was when I was first aware when I was first starting to wake up, which I was very little, like two or three years old when I started to become aware of things, you know, with the tele- telepathy and whatnot. But, you know, I have weird experiences. My life has been really, really strange and I have a lot of weird occurrences. And I was just trying to explain to someone, um, this person wants to come and, and, um, know me in person. And he, and he's hoping that we will end up falling in love and being in a relationship. And I'm pretty sure he's not my twin flame, like, at all. But, you know, he's a really sweet person. And, you know, maybe it's possible. I don't know. I'm trying to get to know him. And he's not quite understanding. And I'm like, you have to understand that I'm weird. He's like, well, I'm a weird person, too. I like this and I like that. And most people don't like these things. And, you know, he's trying to explain it to me. And I'm like, well... Your weird is one level of weird. (laughs) And my level of weird, most people can't bear. You know, it's like, your level of weird to me is normal. You know, you're just unique. But you're not so unique that I haven't met a dozen people like you. And, you know, like with the things you're telling me, you know. it's It's like if a man told me, well, I hope you don't find it weird, but I wear pink shirts. And it's like, yeah, and, you know, I live in South America. Half the people here wear pink it, it, you know, pink shirts. You know, men and women, doesn't matter. They wear purple, they wear pink, they wear pale yellow. You know, shirt, you know, shirt colors that you don't really see in the States. You know, it's like, it's not, for me, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I know tons of people that dress like this, you know. <laughs> you know, and it's not like, 
that was a conversation necessarily, but it's kind of, you know, it's like the example. So for me, that's like, so what, you know, you like polo shirts versus fleece pullovers. I mean, that's not weird. When I say that I'm weird or my life is weird, what I mean is you'll be seen in the living room and all of a sudden the silhouette of a giant dragon will go by you. You can't freak out. Or you'll be in the kitchen cooking and you turn around and there's four aliens that are like eight, eight or nine feet tall standing behind you, staring at you. Or there'll be a dead person asking you to please bring them to heaven. Or, um, you know, if someone in my family is about to die, the angel of death will appear to me at the foot of the bed and let me know. You know, he's there to support me and bring me comfort. You know, this is the kind of crap that happens to me all the freaking time. You know, things will disappear. And if I tell my duende, my little fairy friend here that I need that and I have to explain why I need it, then that thing will reappear within the hour. (laughs) You know, these are the kind of weird things, you know, like I told you guys last year when I was making popcorn and I poured the, poured the, oil in the pan, poured the popcorn in the pan, went in, you know, did the coconut oil and the turmeric, all the things that I do that make popcorn healthy. (laughs) And I went into the other room and I I looked at the clock (coughs) and in my um, living room, only two minutes had gone by, not even like a minute and a half. And I was like on my Netflix trying to find something, but I was watching the time And I was listening, and there was nothing to prevent me from hearing that in the kitchen. And I didn't hear any pops. Next thing I know, um, all the popcorn had caught on fire as if I had been gone 20 minutes, but it was was only one and a half minutes, and I know how long it takes. I make popcorn pretty often. I mention it often enough, you guys should realize (laughs) it's like my snack, right? So I was like, how, how is the time going? You know, in one part of my house, the time is different than in another part of my house. I'm also hopping timelines left and right. I hopped one earlier today. I was, I was at my, um, kitchen sink and, and I'm sure every single one of you, you're aware of when you first turn on the hot water in, in your, in your house, it's cold or cool. And then it gradually gets increasingly more and more warm till it's kind of hot or hot ish. And after a few minutes, it starts to dwindle down. It goes back to cool. It's really normal, right? <laughs> well, what happened to me was not normal. I mean, that normal part happened where it's cold and then warm and then started to get cool again. And all of a sudden it got hot and then cool again really rapidly. It wasn't like a normal gradual thing like normal. And I had a weird feeling in my head. Like I just hopped a timeline and my heart kind of skipped a beat, which happens often when you're consciously aware of hopping a timeline. And I felt different and the energy shifted and I looked around and everything looks the same. I can't tell what actually changed. Usually it's 2% of your world that changes when you hop a timeline and you don't really, usually you won't know what's going on. Usually you won't, you know, like sometimes you'll have like a $10 bill in your purse and the, (laughs) or a wallet and, um, you hop a timeline and you still have $10, but it's 10 ones or it's two fives. It's, it's the same denomination, but a little bit different, a little bit tweaked. You know, and so these are the kinds of, so I'm trying to explain to this person who doesn't, he's awake, he's not awake, I think maybe spiritually, like he says, well, I want to learn about spiritual stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, my life isn't really like just, I'm spiritual. My name is Forrest. You know what I mean? It's not that like when I say I'm spiritual, I think that's what he's thinking. And I'm like, dude, my life is really freaking weird. I mean, I work for God. And since I took on the mantle to work for God, my life has changed drastically. 
in by leaps and bounds. Like I never would have called myself a shaman seven years ago, but now after some of the things I've done, I'm like a shaman of death, dude. I've worked with a lot of dead people. It's like, if you're going to be my friend and in my house and around me, let alone have a relationship with me, you have to understand that you might wake up and there's 1500 dead people in the room and you might not see them, but you're going to feel them and you're going to be like, Whoa, (laughs) I feel like there's a crowd of people. I'm going to have to like push my way through a thousand people between here and the kitchen to get my coffee in the morning. That's the kind of thing I mean. Like it, it's like, it's so hard to explain my, how weird my life is, but it doesn't mean that I'm spiritually advanced. It just means that because I'm consciously aware of the work that God wants me to do. And because I have a conversation with him every day and he tells me what to talk about. And he told me about this topic to bring this up because I still don't know where I'm at spiritually. Like I'm not bilocating consciously, even though bilocation has happened to me a couple times. I'm not like going to sleep and, and then cropping up in India and Belgium and all over the world where people need me. You know, that's the kind of thing that maybe a spiritual master might do. Right. <laughs> and also God wanted me to announce that some of the things that have happened to me that seem so cool and weird and paranormal and supernatural and and, and, and some people have told me I'm jealous of you because all of these things happen around you. You get all these signs in the sky and on the clouds and the numbers and all these signs around you all the time. I'm so jealous because God doesn't talk to me like that and you know, or whatever. And I'm, and I'm like, no. And I told someone this probably 20, 30 years ago, I said, look, this is the thing I've noticed is that when you are a complete and total full believer in all the stuff like, you know, in God and in spiritual stuff, then, and you're just a hundred percent sure it's real. The other stuff's not going to happen, but because I'm stubborn and I'm constantly questioning and I'm constantly like, well, I need a sign for this cause I need to know it's real. Cause I just don't know. It's like, I'm from Missouri, baby. I'm uh, like, I'm from the show me state. Show me, show me, express it to me in a physical way. So I know it's real. Otherwise I'm going to think I'm going crazy. I'm stubborn. I'm Irish. (laughs) And that's why these things happen to me more often than the other people who just are maybe in the flow of it more. (laughs) You know, all the flow I've achieved, I've worked and and scraped and clawed my way to that level of understanding where other people just flowed easily. Like, sure, universe always got my back, you know, and I don't have that attitude all the time. I've got to work for it. I struggle with the belief of it every day of my life. But that, I think, is why I'll look up in the sky and I'll see a Chinese symbol that I recognize And then I'll look out another window on another day and here's the same Chinese symbol. It's like, okay, well, God's showing me. Like this morning, I had my window open and I had my my curtains drawn so that the air would flow from outside because I was hot. I'm like living in a terrarium here in the morning. The sun comes through, (laughs) hits my windows and all of a sudden it's super hot. So I always have to open up the windows and get the fresh air and... I was laying here and I was looking at the clouds reflection in the, um, window. And because I was laying down, I was kind of looking at the clouds reflection sideways and the exact same symbol I saw the other day appeared again in the clouds in the reflection. And I knew that was the first thing that God wanted me to see. And it was the a with a crescent moon that goes across the a but this time at the top, there was a heart on top. And I thought that was really, really cool. I'm like, okay, that's the second time I've seen that exact symbol. I've never seen it anywhere else. And now there's a heart on top. And after I meditated, God said, look, this is your symbol. I'm like, all right. And I said, well, 
when you get around to it, show me the symbol again in the clouds because I want to, I don't want to get a tattoo of something I saw once. I want to see it uh, several times because I want to make sure it's real because I'm stubborn and I don't believe right away and I don't, I doubt myself a lot, you know, so it doesn't mean that I'm more spiritually advanced because you don't get messages in the clouds or whatever. It just means I'm more stubborn. Also, having said that, you probably do get messages in the clouds. You just don't look up. (laughs) Or you don't know what you're looking at. Or your belief or the preclusion in your mind that that's not real, doesn't exist, is going to lead you to a conclusion that it doesn't happen and it's not real. And then you're going to just never look up. I mean, the first time I saw the clouds form... You know, the words, um, I think it said, like, Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, praise and blessings be upon him. It said something like that in the clouds, but I think it also said, um, oh, no, I think that's what it was. I just, I recognized it as Arabic writing. I was on the freeway going, like, 65 miles an hour, pulled to the side to the shoulder and took a picture of this. And a few days later, she had my friend, and he's. And this was right after I became a Muslim. That was the first time I saw riding in the sky uh, from the clouds. It wasn't like from a plane, because you guys have seen Arabic riding. My God, there's no way a plane could. It would crash, you know. So and there was like no other clouds in the sky. It was crazy. And then the second time I've noticed that was, you know, like actual words in the sky was when I was in the Amazon jungle. And there was no clouds in the sky. And all of a sudden I looked up and puffy white clouds had a lowercase H and a lowercase I. And it just said hi. And I'm like looking around. Is that meant for me? And then I realized I'm in the Amazon jungle. Yo, they speak native languages in Spanish here. You know, what's hi? You know, like they, they wouldn't understand. So it was for me. And I was like, Virgil, Virgil, you know, like to get my son over. You know, like Alice, Alice trying to get my, my daughter. And, and by the time I got them over to me, the clouds were gone. It was just a message for me. And and I couldn't get my camera out in time. I was like, oh man, that would have been the coolest picture ever. (laughs) Clouds would say hi, right? So, I mean, if, if the signs are happening all around you, it doesn't mean you're more advanced. You might just be stubborn like me and you need more signs to build and build up your belief. And if you're not gaining signs, it doesn't mean you're less advanced than me. It just means that maybe you might be in the flow and you might be more advanced than me. It doesn't, I don't know. And you don't know either. And there's no way we can judge where we're at on that. Cause only God is the one that truly knows your higher self knows. And you're not likely to get the information because it might bolster your ego or it might give you an insecurity in your ego, depending on where you're perceiving yourself to be. All right. So God's telling me this right now. Okay. So, and by the way, yeah, I hear the voice of God. And if you want to hear the voice of God, you just ask, (laughs) Hey God, can I start hearing your voice? Can we have that kind of a relationship, please? I want to be your best friend. I want you to be my best friend. You're already closer to me than my jugular vein, so why can't I hear your voice? I want to hear your voice. I mean, that was like kind of a conversation that I had with God many, 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 many times for years before I heard the voice of God. I kept asking. And you might ask and hear it tomorrow or hear it five minutes from now or it might be six years from now, but keep keep asking if that's what you really, truly want. But I mean, I kept asking and finally I'm here, but it took me years to get here, like almost 20 years <laughs> from the first time I asked till the time I was able, it was like maybe 17 years or something. So <clears throat> basically, you know, I hear the voice of God. What, I'm sorry. Tell me what you said. Prime creator, please tell me what was it you just said to tell the people, um, like, okay, I lost it. Now I can't hear. So anyway, where were we? We're talking about how, so you don't know where you're okay. Right. This is, thank you. He just reminded me. He says, okay, look, you are, 
love coming from love. That's all you truly, really need to know. And you don't need to worry about, you know, I'm spiritually awake and now I'm a fully enlightened master. No, that's not true. And it might be true, but it might not be true. You know what I mean? Like, it's not true just because you became aware of chakras this week. Now, you know, or if your Kundalini rises once, does that mean you're a spiritual master? No, I don't consider myself a spiritual master yet. I might be, but I don't know it. I don't, I don't consider myself that, but I know my Kundalini has risen many, many times. You know, the first time it happened, I'm all, is that it? <laughs> Am I enlightened now? Woo, is this it? And, and my husband just looked to me, he's like, if you have to ask, you're probably not, right? And I'm like, damn it, how much more, how much farther is this road, man? How much more do I have to go through and suffer and endure? And how much more uh, impatience do I have to feel before I am enlightened, right? And we talked about it at length, I mean, for hours and hours sometimes for the course of our 13 year marriage. And it felt like the answer that was right for both of us. And it seems to be right for everyone is by the time you've achieved complete and total and utter enlightenment, you don't care about the signs anymore. You don't care about the, um, parlor tricks or the, Ooh, I get to buy locate. Ooh, I get to float. Ooh, I want to, you know, <laughs> All the neat little tricks, right? I want to levitate things, you know? It's like, I definitely want all that. It's going to be freaking cool. But it's a relationship you have with God, which is more important than any of that. You know, like my ex-boyfriend from when I was like 19 years old, he told me once, he's like, you know, I don't think Jesus was so much an enlightened master as an alien from outer space. And he could do things that were easy, you know, easy to his race. Every born in his race probably could do it. And he just came to earth and, uh, you know, he just could do these parlor tricks, got people to follow him. And then they started to listen to him about the message of love and peace. That was his, his opinion. I don't think it's real. Although I do think Jesus was Pleiadian, but um, most of us are. Most of us have um, genetics of other ET races that are embedded in us from generations back. You know, but I don't know. I just don't want you guys to look at someone else and then be disappointed in your own spiritual life, right? And I don't want you to judge yourself too far askew in either direction, right? And, I, and I'm and i telling myself this as much as I'm telling you guys. Like, there are some people I'll see on YouTube and they'll have all these illustrations and diagrams that they draw because they have, they got some download information. And then I'm like, well, why don't I get those technical drawings, you know? Probably because I don't like to draw technical stuff. So why am I, why am I bitching about that? That's weird. You know, know? and the one time I did get a drawing like that in my head and I drew it out and I was getting ready to explain it. I tried to do the video for it and I did the video like four or five times and every time something went wrong, like YouTube refused to upload it. Or it, you know, took, it was like a 10 minute video and five hours it would take to upload. And then when it did, it wouldn't have any sound. Um, one time I upload, then I had to start over. And then in another video, um, I was moving so fast that my head would disappear (laughs) and my hands would disappear. And it's like, do I just have the shittiest camera on earth or what? You know, I know I like move around a lot because I have ADHD, but is that what's happening or did they somehow alter the video? Like what the hell is that? It's like it it wouldn't upload. And I realized that's not my job. It's not my job to have the illustrations and have the scientific explanations of the matrix or the way the vortexes are working right now or whatever. That's not who I'm meant to be. Not supposed to be the people doing that. 
I'm the one doing the things that I'm doing right now to help you guys. Talking about the emotional stuff and the psychological stuff and the relationship to self, others, and spirit. I'm the voice of God in the way that I can be. And you know what? I'm not the only one. You're the voice of God too in the way that you can be. Because, you know, I might hear, you know, one tenth of what I was, you know, supposed to hear and, you know, ten other people have to come up with their message, you know, and then you put all the messages together and then you're like, oh, there's the picture. There might be a thousand or 10,000 or 144,000 messages, you know, so I'm just one, I'm just one little tiny factor in one little piece of the puzzle, right? And if you're listening to me and you continue to listen to me, you'll get more and more and more of the puzzle as you go along, but supplement it with your own personal research and your own meditation and your own insights and ask for your own signs because that's how you're going to put it all together and talk to your friends who are becoming awake and listen to other videos. And I will always tell you guys when I think of someone who's real, when I feel that someone is genuine and real and getting real information, then I will guide you to them. And if you feel like the need to listen and, and you connect with them also, then that information from them is meant for you as well. Right? So anyway, that's my, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Right? Okay. I asked God cause all of this was God's idea. It's a little bit of an uncomfortable thing, but years ago I saw this, um, this cartoon animated short of two, um, children. They were Buddhist monks as children and they were trying to meditate and then they made it into a spiritual competition and they, they were like, well, I'm staying up straighter than you. I'm holding my hands at a better angle than you. Um, you know, like I can hum louder than you, or I'm in perfect pitch more than you. And they, they didn't say it out loud, but you could tell what they were thinking. You know, like a butterfly landed on my nose and I'm not moving and I'm doing this better than you, you know, you know, it's just like they're comparing instead of going on their own spiritual journey to connect with the divine. They were worried about what their neighbor was doing. <laughs> you know, well, your hands are fidgeting and I'm still, your hands are not in the proper position and mine are, I'm better than you, you know? And it's that petty ego crap that we have to get rid of to get to the true authentic self underneath it. So God wanted me to bring all this up to you today. We talked about all the different things I could talk about. And he's like, yeah, this is something that some of you are going through and we all go through it. So don't worry about it. If you, you know, don't be embarrassed or feel bad that you were thinking this one way or the other in one direction or the other, because everyone on the spiritual path goes through these thoughts. You know, when I was first waking up, it, awakening, it looked like everyone in their brother and their mother and their sister, they all had crystals and they all had the hypnosis tapes and they all had the gongs or the bells or whatever to meditate. And they all had their meditation spaces set up already. And I'm like, I have this one little tiny crystal in my purse. It's like an inch long, you know, and I'm like feeling super spiritually inadequate here. <laughs> you know, and I remember those days just feeling like, dude, this isn't how come everyone else seems like they have so much more knowledge and information and I'm never going to catch up. I'm never going to get there. And I read books and read books and read books. And then it got to a point where 20 years later, I went into a store to look for new spiritual information. And I had read like 75% of the books on the shelf. And the other 25% of the books, it was pretty much information that I had already that was like re regurgitated stuff from the other 75% of the books. And I'm not saying it's that way today. In fact, I, I, 
I just saw like last year, like 20 new books, 20 new books of information that I don't have. I'm like, oh yeah, the wave came through again and other people got information that I don't have again. But boy, it was like a dry spell for years. I was like, there's nothing there's nothing on these shelves that I don't know, save for the Urantia book, because holy crap, that's a huge book, and I haven't read it yet. It's a free downloadable app, by the way, if you want to read that. And then the other book was The Book of Enoch. I still haven't gone all the way through that. But other than that, like at that time, it was, I don't know, it was like 15 years ago now. But I remember just looking at this, show, like being bored. I'm like, how am I bored right now looking at these books? Nothing excites me. Because I have all this knowledge already. And it made me feel weird because I'm like, am I enlightened? Well, if I have to ask that question, the answer is damn no. Hell no. Not yet. And then I was just frustrated. <laughs> you know? So you, 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 you'll get it from all the angles of it. But just don't ever compare yourself to anyone else in any direction. Just stay to your lane. Keep going in your own way. Because you're going to get there no matter what. You might get there tomorrow, 10 minutes from now, next week, or in a hundred years, maybe in three more lifetimes, you'll have it. You know, chances are though, you're, you're pretty close to the finish line. At least at the end of the schematic is where we are. And so a lot of us are, we're getting to that point where all we need to know from this world is pretty much you're close. So don't worry about it. Just enjoy the ride just enjoy the journey so all right let's get to it spaceweather.com solar winds picked up a little bit it's 462.9 kilometers per second um a minor but long-lasting crack has opened up in the earth's magnetic field and um basically solar wind has been pouring through the gap it's causing geomagnetic unrest. So if you're in the Arctic, you're going to see auroras. And if you're not, there's always YouTube with live cams. I don't know any good ones, but there are several. So you could always go check it out when you've got a few minutes. It makes for a nice screensaver in the background if you're doing something else. Um, absolutely no sunspots. Day 16 without sunspots. Crazy stuff. Cosmic rays, we have very high neutron counts. That means we're still being bombarded by cosmic radiation. The solar winds that flew, what had flown from the cosmic, not the cosmic, hello, the coronal um, holes in the sun uh, should be here Thursday and Friday. So expect to have a little bit more of a headiness about you, kind of... Um, I don't know, you might feel like sleepy, tired, a little bit spacey, um, other ascension symptoms. We'll figure out what they are when, when they get here, I guess. But, um, you know, 20th and 21st is when it's due. <laughs> uh, there were only four fireballs reported over the United States, um, from NASA's fireball, uh, reporting center, basically the all sky fireball network and Elon Musk has launched from Puerto Rico, 60 new star Starlink satellites. I mean, on one hand it's good. Well, no matter where we are in the globe, we're going to have, um, internet. The original idea was that it was going to be free. And someone did say something like it might be paid service. But it might be worth it. It actually might be worth it. So no matter where you are, you have crisp, clean, great service. But I, I don't like the fact that it's messing up the night sky for astronomers. Because I, for one, love to see pictures that other people take. I mean, I don't have the equipment or, you know, if I had the money, I'd probably actually take these kind of pictures myself to buy the heavy-duty telescopes and cameras and stuff. But... I used to take my kids to an observatory and we had special, um, there's special nights where you could go and there's this concrete slab and it's like at an angle and it's in a circle, like an arena. 
and we go and we lay down on the slab so it's really comfortable and you could just look up at the night sky and they take a pointer a laser pointer and they tell you what all the stars are and we got to see a stellar nursery and it was really special so I love astronomy I love it very much but I don't don't expect me to know anything in the sky and where I'm at now I know the northern hemisphere stars mostly but I couldn't tell you Spica from well Delph I know the dolphin one Delphi but I don't know we'll get there someday I'll get there someday <laughs> I know the Pleiades, yay! I know Orion, yay! And that's about it. I don't know a whole lot more. Beetlejuice is part of Orion. I just read the other day. Oh, poor Beetlejuice. I hope that... Well, we'll see what's happening to Beetlejuice in upcoming weeks, I guess. So, not much going on with DisclosureNews.it. Really, Power 10 is all they had. So, we're going to skip that for now. Um... Not a lot going on there, right? you know, just barely above normal. So, on heartmouth.org, as far as the Shimon residence is concerned, we started off with, uh, we'll start off with California. They started with 50 hertz frequency on the Shimon residence scale at midnight, and by 5 a.m., they were just still at 50 straight all the way across, didn't even change for the whole day. Um, Hofuf Saudi Arabia remained at zero all the way across. Lithuania started off at 16 at midnight and went down to zero by 5 a.m. Alberta, Canada started off at 61 hertz frequency at midnight and went up to 62 only by 5 a.m. And Northland, New Zealand started off at 65 at midnight and they were also at 62 at 5 a.m. So I thought that was a strange round number for both in a row. Very weird. And then in Hulului, South Africa, at midnight, they start off at 261 hertz frequency and they're coming back on down and they were at 206 by 5 a.m. hertz frequency. And that's the Schumann Resonance news um, for the night. Now, I did want to mention that Hulului, South Africa got up to 273 hertz frequency at 8 o'clock at night at 20 hundred hours. <laughs> 20 bells if you're in the Navy. But at 20 um, yesterday, so... I thought that was uh, pretty cool that they went way up there because by midnight they were only to 261 and then by 5 a.m. down to 206. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, all right. So I don't know about you, but um, A Course in Miracles lesson yesterday really helped me a lot. It helped clear up a lot of mental and emotional and spiritual blocks I'd been having um, for three or four days. It cleared up a lot of my anxiety. So um, hopefully you will find comfort in these as well as I read them every day. But I'm really grateful to this, uh, especially yesterday after how it made me feel after I read the lesson. I was like, oh my God, it was a night and day difference for me. So I was really grateful for that. Anyway, today, for the Foundation for Inner Peace is found at ACIM.org, and today we are on Lesson 236, and this is the lesson. I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. I have a kingdom I must rule. At times, it does not seem I am its king at all. <laughs> it seems to triumph over me and tell me what to think and what to do and feel. And yet, it has been given me to serve whatever purpose I perceive in it. My mind can only serve. Today, I give its service to the Holy Spirit to employ as he sees fit. I thus direct my mind, which I alone can, can rule. And thus I set it free 
to do the will of God. Father, my mind is open to your thoughts and close today to every thought but yours. I roll my mind and offer it to you. Accept my gift, for it is yours to me. I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. Again, that's Lesson 236. You may go to acim.org to look this up. It's always free. Or you can download an app. Just look up A Course in Miracles in your Play Store or what have you. And there you go. You can start the lessons at any time. There's 365 lessons. So we're we're like two-thirds of the way through. It's pretty cool. And we're going to keep going. So anyway, um, I'm going to take a quick break. And when I come back, this is Relationship Tuesday because we're still in the love month. And we're going to talk about what are the different ways to be emotionally supportive for another person? Um, a lot of us were not raised in a way in which we were supported emotionally, and we don't know what that looks like. And we don't know what it feels like, and we don't know how to be that for the other person. It's not something that comes naturally. It's something we've got to learn. It seems like it comes natural for some people, but when you look at their background, they probably had loving and supportive parents. You know, like my mom that adopted me was very loving and very supportive, but my parents divorced when I was five. So my dad was, for the most part, emotionally supportive and my stepmom was not and my my second my dad's second wife and his third wife were not very supportive of me and I didn't feel that and I didn't know what it looks like and I it's some, one of those things that I still struggle with today you know um, the other day someone accused me of not being supportive you know he told me he was in the situation and I said well here's a solution I just gave him a solution to his problem. I'm like, well, good luck with that. And I thought that was being supportive. So I started looking into it. Like, maybe he's right. He accused me of not being supportive. That I was being cold and unfeeling. I'm like, this isn't a time for emotion, man. You just told me you're going to be homeless without food, you know, like money for food. Like, I was giving you advice and and that's not what he asked for. Right? (laughs) And usually I am emotionally supportive or I think I'm being. So I want to explore it for myself. And I feel like maybe we ought to explore it for, you know, you guys have to explore it too. If You know, chances are if you're listening to me, maybe, you know, you're here for a reason too. And maybe you are the one that's emotionally supportive, but the person you're involved with is not. And you haven't been able to put a finger on What exactly is emotionally supportive? What is it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What are the words that you need to say? And maybe, just maybe, after tonight, you'll be able to express it in a way and communicate in a way with your loved one, whether it's your teacher or your child or your partner or your boss or your best friend. You know, this these levels of communication you know, I want to go deep with this because we should know how to be that. And also we could assess if it's in our lives, the way that we need to, it to show up for ourselves. You know, many times in many different relationships in my life, I only wanted the guy to put his arms around me and say, don't worry, honey, everything's going to be okay. I know it. I feel it everything's going to be all right. And I mean, so many times I never heard those words from people that I wanted to hear so bad. And I never could express it other than I want you to say that. And then if they say it, it's like, well, you're just saying it because I said to say it. Like, pfft, that's not being supportive at all. It's just being a mimic. It's like, <laughs> you're being a parrot. I don't need a parrot. I need a man, right? <laughs> 
you know, and when I have relationships with women, because I am bisexual, when I had relationships with women, they were always so emotionally supportive, and yet I couldn't, like, put a finger on what is it this, it just seemed so simple, their words, and yet they were so supportive, and maybe it was more than words, so after the break, we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about this, how does it show up, how can you be more supportive, and How can you assess if you are being supported or not? How can you help your partner get there to support you emotionally right after this message? If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's high time you did. It is the absolute easiest way to make a podcast. First of all, it's absolutely free. Second of all, they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. You guys have known that I've been doing this for eight months using the anchor.fm app right on my cell phone and I have done it everywhere, right? I have recorded this in my living room, my bedroom, little cafes in Quito, Ecuador, all over Cuenca. It's so absolutely easy to make your podcast and editing is just a snap. Anchor also will distribute your podcast for you. And it took me about two and a half months to become syndicated. And now I'm available on Spotify, Apple podcast, and many more and so can you you can make money from your podcast also and there's no minimum requirement you get paid from your very first listener it is everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place so please if you are interested in making a podcast of your very own do not hesitate to start with anchor Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Oprah Winfrey said that there is no strength without struggle. I read that today and I felt that It's absolutely true. I mean, we're going to go through hard times, right? Whether it's a really crappy day where it's just nothing goes right or, you know, when bad things happen to good people. You know, most of us are good people, or at least we want to think we are. But sometimes bad things or struggly things happen. And that's character building. It's, it's going to make us stronger, but during these times, we're going to need more emotional support, but not just in the times of struggle, but in our everyday lives and our day to day, we need that emotional support from the people around us. And we should be showing emotional support for them as well. It's a two-way street. You know, it's not enough to love them and never say I love you. It's not enough to um, say you love them but never hug them or hold their hand, you know. You have to show support in a number of ways, not just with your words. You know, so, you know, uh... Like, for example, if you um, really care about somebody and you say, you could do it, babe, it's cool, you're going to do it, you're going to get through it, or I'm really proud of you, and then, like, they don't, why are they proud of you when they don't take any interest in what it is that you're doing? That's So it's like, there's got to be follow through with the words. You know, it feels like um, words of encouragement that don't have a backup, they feel empty. So um, if someone says, you know, like, for example, okay, I have my podcast, right? And I work really hard 
and I do the podcast, um, I have 400, more than 400 episodes complete that anyone could go around the world could go for free and listen to my show, you know, and that's quite an accomplishment because when you look at most spiritual podcasts, they only have four or five or six weeks worth of material. And the last time they did anything was two or three years ago. And it's like, wow, it's really an accomplishment to do this every single day for a whole year like I did. And to continue on with that. And I already have 400 episodes, right? So I know it is. And I I forced myself to do this. And after a while, it became so easy and fun that it's not a force anymore. In the beginning, it was God forced me, actually not me. (laughs) But for years, I've been trying to do this. And I wasn't really encouraged by anyone but God, you know, but it, it wasn't, (laughs) I don't know how to explain it other than I had to encourage myself. Right. And I feel like I've done this thing. And for me, this is pretty great. I actually stuck with something. (laughs) I actually did it. Right. And then when people want to be my friend or they want to try to date me or something, and if they are trying to be supportive without knowing, like they say, I want to hear your voice. Well, you know what? I have 400 episodes of my voice. Here's a list, (laughs) you know, here's, here's, here's the the link, you know, and they go, Oh, but I want to hear a message you made for me. It's like, but this is all about me. It's my personality. It's who I am. You know, it's what I do. It's like, if you want to get to know me, get to know me through my podcast, because I'm really genuine about who I am through the show. You know, I'm not putting on airs. I'm not writing like, I'm not like reading somebody else's words. My show is me. This is me. Metaphysical soul speak. This is me. Right. And I was trying to explain that to someone today. And I was like, you know, I know you say that you think I'm brilliant, but how would you know? You know, other than I say, hi, how are you? Hope you're feeling good today. You know, but I don't really go too deep in our day-to-day conversations when they're only for one or two minutes, right? So how do you know I'm a deep person unless you listen to my show, for example? You know, and for someone to say, well, you're doing a really good job. How would you know? I might have put out 400 really crappy episodes. You don't know until you listen, right? You know, and if you're a writer, you know, you're a journalist for the New York Times and someone wants to date you and they've never actually read one of your articles and they said, you're a great writer. How do you know I'm a great writer? Well, they hired you at the New York Times. Yeah, but you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like a weird, like, I'm interested in you, but not totally. I'm only interested in the idea of you, right? So it's not very encouraging. It's not very supportive. And We all need someone to want to know us, right? You know, if you are the CEO of a corporation, I'm sure you've got some cool ass stories and I want to hear them. You work in a toy factory. I want to know how the toys are made. What material? Who makes the designs? Do you know those people or is that what you're doing? You know, like if someone tells me what their profession is, I mean, unless it's something super easy. Like I, I'm a dentist. Okay. Well, I pretty much know what you do. Don't want to hear about people's teeth. Ew, gross. Don't want to hear about what you found in people's mouths. Blah, you know, but for the, <laughs> I don't want to date a dentist, but for the most part, like someone says they're a playwright. Oh, do you have any plays? Have they been performed? What did that feel like? You know, that's encouragement. That's supportive. Right. And I feel like, um, I have had in the past people try to, um, ask me out and then I'm like, well, what, let's get to know each other a little bit. Oh, it doesn't matter what you do, baby. I'm going to love you no matter what. Really? Really? I mean, if I'm an assassin for hire, you're going to love me still. <laughs> if I'm a circus freak and I get shot out of a cannon every week, are you still going to love me? <laughs> Uh, You have to honestly understand what the person is about before you can be loving and supportive of them, I think. You have to have more than just a surface interest, you know. Um, 
somebody wrote me um, from the social site I'm on and saw a picture of me in the jungle in Peru. And he's like, oh, I could tell you really like going to the jungle a lot. And I thought that was hilarious. I'm like, yeah, I went there once three years ago. (laughs) You know, just because I have a picture doesn't mean I like to do that a lot, you know. (laughs) You have to, like, can't just extrapolate somebody's entire life and existence based on one picture. Like, what if I want to ride my bicycle every single day? And that's what I do a lot. But I don't put 500 pictures of me riding my bicycle because it's boring in my opinion, right? So you, it's like you never know another person until you know them, right? And when you know them, even in person, you don't always know everything about them. Like I had a, I had a girlfriend and, and um, not someone I was dating, but just a friend, a friend, friend. And we were always um, getting together with our kids for play dates. And she was such a sweet person. And we, um, we got together every week and, and we loved each other so much. And we were always talking about stuff, but it was always like the day to day, you know, what it's like. She had an autistic son who was very brilliant and we were very loving and supportive of him. And, um, she was always talking about the struggle with that. And, and I was talking about, um, the struggle with my, um, relationship as it was breaking up, you know, and she was there very supportive of me. I was there for her when her marriage broke up and we were always talking about the day to day and we were really good friends. And then we went on a trip together and it wasn't until we were driving home. She started telling me about when she was working before now, she's a stay at home mom, but what did she do years ago in New York? I'm like, I didn't even know you lived in New York. And it's so weird. I've known you five years or something. And how is it possible that I didn't know that about you? And it just, it can take years to know somebody, you know? And so I feel like really asking those deep questions and going, sometimes going on a road trip, even for the day with somebody or putting yourself in a space where there's no cell phones, there's no TV, there's no distraction, there's not anyone else. And you're just on in the road, you know, on the road in a car together. That's one of the best ways to get to know someone. Maybe take a cruise together. You just, you're away from civilization. You're still, you know, in it, but not really. And those kinds of experiences really pull out bits and snippets <laughs> as I said last week a few times it pulls out things of the other person and then you can appreciate them more and it will help you to be more supportive and more encouraging when you know their background when you know what they're capable of and when you're able to appreciate an, another person more and I feel like it's like really important to understand what a person does because that tells you who they are. You know, if someone is a salesperson and they, they sell, um, high ticket items like real estate or cars, then you could tell that they're really ambitious and that they're always pushing themselves. They have an inner drive. And if somebody is a kindergarten teacher, they're pretty much going to be a very sweet, very loving, very patient, understanding person. It's important to know what someone does, whether they're your friend or your partner. And you have to know what do they go through on a daily basis because how else are you going to know how to support them? You know, just very easy. You know, it's um, like my friend uh, was going to do some spiritual things and also um, like recycling type of things in her neighborhood. And I was like, that is the coolest thing ever because that's so needed. And she's like, I just want to save the world one project at a time. But if I didn't know that about her, I would just think she's just some mom, you know, like I have to know more in order to appreciate the person more, you know, like I had another girlfriend who told me about her struggles as a child growing up in, um, on living on the very edge of a wealthy white neighborhood and she was black and having to go through that neighborhood and having 
the other kids um, threatening her life on her way home from school every single day. And she's one of the strongest people I know now. She's one of the sweetest people, but she is tough as nails. You know, she plays it cool and she plays it like really sweet, like very loving and laughing. But boy, you cross her in, in a wrong way. I, I like you'll rule, you'll rue the day. Like, I mean, I would never want to be on the opposite end of, of, uh, of my friend. <laughs> you know, I would never want to cross her because she's so tough now. But she, it took that experience every single day struggling and being afraid and having to stand up to the bullies that were so much bigger than her. She was just a very little girl. And she said her mommy used to put her in little dresses and she'd have her, her legs would be bare. And she was always scared of, um, falling and and skinning her knee. And that was like her fear. And she doesn't like to run now. She likes to dance. Oh man, I've danced with her all night long. We've gone to parties together. That's like all we did. (laughs) <laughs> we go get the Patron and then we hit the dance floor and that's like all we did all night, you know? <laughs> and she's like, oh, like 20 years older than me. I think she will never really tell me her real age, but she's, she's quite a bit older than me, but she, she doesn't look her age, but she's tough, man. And it's, it took me, it's taken me years. And even now, <clears throat> even now I still learn more about her. And she's very positive, but she's been through some very negative things, but she's tough as nails and she's strong, you know? So like if you ever meet someone who's strong, be encouraging and see more about who they are, where they come from, right? That for me, that's a way of being emotionally supportive, but we're going to get into this, um, as far as these articles here, I found, excuse me, man, I'm like, I, I had, um, my window open and, uh, the volcanic ash came my way. <laughs> so I breathed in a whole bunch of it while I was asleep and I didn't know, but I was so hot that I opened my window and then I fell asleep. So, <clears throat> so bear with me as I go through this, um, congestion today. All right. So psychology today.com is a good resource for a lot of different things. And this article is 10 ways to get and give emotional support. And so the number one, and this is like with a romantic partner, but you can take this down a couple notches to use it. You use information for, um, you know, your children, your neighbors, your friends, your family, people you work with, you know, coworkers, your sister, your brother, you know, um, you know, your father, whatever, like you can use this information, just, you know, kind of tailor, make it to the situation you're in with the person that you're, um, dealing with at the moment. So number one is touch each other often. Well, that's like kind of awkward. If you're like a teacher, you don't want to touch your students, right? That's like really illegal and wrong. But, um, as far as like, if it's just like a friend, you know, hold your friend's hand, put your arm around your friend's shoulder, give them a hug. Hello and a hug goodbye. You know, I learned very early on as a child that you should always tell people how you feel about them because you never know when it's going to be your last day on earth. You never know when it's going to be their last day. When I was very little, my, my parents didn't come home one day after school. I was a latchkey kid. I always had three hours alone every day. And I had to walk home a couple of miles. And then after I got home, it was three hours waiting and it was crazy. You know, those three hours, like sometimes I loved my time alone. Maybe that's why I like time alone now, but sometimes, um, it was a little scary if they were a little bit late. And one time they didn't come home for like almost seven hours. And I literally, had no idea what to do. I, I was like, um, I don't know where my baby brother's at because the place that was supposed to watch him would only watch him till six. It was like seven 30 at night. I was totally alone. My dad wasn't there. My stepmom wasn't there. Where the hell's my brother? And I didn't get a phone call until seven 30. 
and I was at, you know, so it's like really late and it, it actually was only four and a half hours, but it felt like seven hours. I was like, Oh my God, actually they didn't come home till almost nine o'clock at night, but I knew where they were at seven thirty. They called my grand, my grandpa, which he was just a guy we knew from church, but I called him and his wife, grandma, and grandpa. I just loved them very much. They were like an extra set of grandparents. And, um, my, uh, grandma was a guy grabbed her purse and my grandpa went after him and the guy shot him in the face, but it was with snake shot. So it was like just little tiny, like BBs all over his face. And so he had to go into surgery and they had to remove like 10 little pellets that had lodged. Even one of them pierced his ear and they made fun of him for that. Like it was like ridiculous, but they lived on Figueroa Avenue, which is one of the longest streets in Los Angeles. And, um, they lived in the super, super kind of sketch neighborhood in a building that was like a hundred years old. The elevator was like, you could crank. There's like a crank. It was a crank elevator. (laughs) It was really insane. But I mean, I remember being so scared because I thought my parents had died. Maybe my brother died and now I live in this house by myself. What am I going to do? Like it was terrifying, you know? So I learned early on to always tell people how I feel about them, you know, and how to, you know, be honest about my feelings because I never know, right? You never know. So I was always emoting (coughs) to the point of it being uncomfortable for other people in the situation because it's like, you know, I'm like maybe overly compensating because I don't know if they're going to die today. You know, it's it's always been like a PTSD based fear, Ah, you know, so anyway, but touching each other often, that's, you can just throw your arm around your friend, you know, you know, uh, little kids like kind of punch themselves, punch each other in the arm a little bit, like kind of playful, not really hard, but just kind of a playful, Hey, you know, and, um, that's, that's still a form of emotional support. So, um, But most people are touch starved, holding hands, walking arm in arm, cuddling on the couch with your sweetheart. Those are just some of the simple ways that you can share this very powerful experience. You know, like, and even like if you have a teenage kid, you just kind of tousle their, tousle, I don't know how to say that, just kind of touch their hair a little bit, like, you know, put your hand on their shoulder assuringly. You know, teenagers get kind of weird about wanting to be hugged all the time when they're when you have little kids you always want to hug them and cuddle with them then they get to be teenagers like that's weird ma I don't want to I want my friends to see that or it's a little odd you know it's awkward now you know and and it does it gets awkward so it's like you know there's still you kind of you have to have some sort of connection with the people around you but um this is again the, the articles for people that you're in love with like in a romantic relationship with but Again, just extrapolate the information for other relationships. So number two, be respectful of your partner's feelings. If the one that you love is dealing with a loss or a disappointment in life, you have to let this person know that you're available to talk and allow them to have the space to process feelings and you know, not really asking too many questions. I'm, I'm guilty of that quite often. I ask too much. Well, how do you feel now? (laughs) No. How do you feel now? I'm just kidding. I don't do that. (laughs) That's terrible. I don't do that at all. But, um, you know, just letting them have the space to process information. Um, like if someone loses a job, they have to figure it out for themselves, just giving them the space and the grace and just be like, Hey, you know what, man, that, that, that's really, um, that must feel really terrible. I can't imagine what you're going through because you can't, because even though you've been through the same thing, maybe you don't know what they're going through. I can't imagine what you're going through, but I kind of see that it's hurting you and I'm sorry about that. If there's anything I can do to be there for you, if you need to talk, if you just need me to make you a bowl of soup, I'm here for you. Let me know. You know, that's like, those are words of uh, of encouragement and support, right? Okay, so I love this one. Give small gifts just because. 
my mom and I used to have a thing where, um, we would just say that just because my mom would call me and go, I love you. And I'd go, why? And she'd go, well, just because, just because. And so when I became an adult and I earned money, the first money I earned, I sent my mom a bouquet of her favorite, um, daisies and on the card, I just wrote just because, and I didn't put anything else. I just wrote just because. And she called me and she was crying at work. I'm like, ha ha, I made you cry at work. Ha ha. And she was laughing and I was laughing. And she's like, oh, you. And she's like, it just, it just touched me because I always say that to you. It was the first time you ever said it to me. And I'm like, yeah, I know, huh? So every now and again, I'd send her um, flowers and write on the card just because. And, and, and that's that's supportive giving small gifts just because just because you love them just because they're in your mind and your heart and your thoughts and your prayers being surprised every once in a while helps keep romance alive in a relationship of partners or a married couple right it lets your your mate know that she or he is someone special to you you know putting sweet little notes in in their pocket or in their wallet or purse or backpack, you know, sweet little words of encouragement, you know, little heart on it. It's very sweet. Compliment your partner in front of other people. This one's really important. It's number four, saying nice things about your, your, um, partner in front of other people. It's one of the most supportive things you can do because it not only makes your partner feel good about themselves, it will make them feel great about being with you. You know, it's not enough to just say, and, and I don't mean complimenting them. Like they, I'm sure they don't mean it like, like about their looks. Oh, you're beautiful. Well, there's nothing I could do about that. (laughs) Hmm. You know, I can make myself look a little better, I suppose, but you know, God made me this way. It's not something I did. So compliment your partner about something that they like who they have shaped their own personality to be or something they've accomplished. Like, you know what? You, you wrote that trilogy last year and you got to be the number one bestseller on Amazon. And you know what? I, I'm, I'm still blown away. Your ideas are so unique and I'm so proud of you because you worked so hard on that. You know, something like that. Like that'd be so much more than your hair looks good today. You know what I mean? Like that's a compliment, but it's kind of like weird. Like, yeah, thanks. I could really wield that curling iron. Wow. You know? (laughs) So when you compliment someone, make sure it's not about their looks. Don't objectify your partner. So, okay. Number five is disagree with your partner in a kind and loving way. Don't ever judge them or reject them because their desires or their ideas are different than yours. Even if they're wildly different than yours, um, you have to consider the other person, the other person's point of view. Um, even if you don't agree with it, just consider it for a minute. Take a few deep breaths. If you, if it's like something really crazy that you're having a hard time handling and just if you have to disagree with something, an idea that they have, just make sure that you express it with kindness. Well, I do hear you that safety orange is a color that you feel really passionate about. You'd like to paint our kitchen that color, but the reason I would maybe not want that color is I think it might give me a headache first thing in the morning and it might encourage us to fight more because it's the color of a safety cone. <laughs> it's, it's a lot nicer than saying, Oh hell no, you suck that you don't know anything. You don't know the first thing about decorating. What are you an idiot? I mean, that would be like the opposite of support, right? <laughs> okay. So number six, So if you have to disagree, just disagree in a very sweet and gentle way, you know, be kind because after the disagreement's over, you're still going to have to live with the person, right? You don't want them to rack up all the reasons why they shouldn't be with you anymore. They should instead be making a list of all the reasons that they're 
damn lucky they're in a relationship with you. And you should be doing the same. Be grateful for, have a list, a running list of all the reasons you love them and you're so grateful they're in your life, right? All right, so say I love you. You know, actually hearing it is super important to people. Um, There's many ways to show your love, but if you only show your love and you never say the words, then that's not very supportive. So it helps to assure your partner, reassure them with the words as well as with your actions. Number seven, don't ever ignore their presence. It's very hurtful if you're treated like you know, if it, you know, if you treat them like they don't exist or vice versa, it's like so hurtful, you know, like you haven't seen them all day and they come home from work and you don't even look up from your computer or your book or whatever you're doing. And they say hi and you kind of grunt, eh. you know, no, stand up, look them in the eye, acknowledge their presence and say, I'm so glad you're home and you're safe. Everything is okay. Let's let's uh, talk about dinner plans. You know, it's so much better than <laughs> ignoring them. Even if you're really angry at that person, there's no reason to be rude to them. If they love you and you love them, and right now you're angry and they're angry, still acknowledge their presence. Hey, babe, you know what? I know that you love me. I know that I love you. I know we're in a fight right now, but you know what? We should have eaten an hour ago. Let's get dinner started. Let's put the fight on hold. Let's eat. And then maybe two hours after dinner, we can resume. Or maybe tomorrow, we'll continue with the conversation. You know, it's easy. It's easy to say these words and mean them and follow through. So just, I guess it says, what it says here for, in the psychology today article, they say, stop and think what life would be like if your sweetheart wasn't with you. If you feel sad and you feel like you really truly can't live without them, then don't ever take them for granted. Don't ever just ignore them like that. It's so hurtful. Number eight, and if your partner is ignoring you, like quite often, it it might be time to move on. You know, to someone who's going to be thrilled to the teeth every time you walk in that door. You know, I feel like if someone doesn't hug you goodbye and hug you hello and kiss you, then they're probably not really worth having around, right? Like, if they're not going to be affectionate with you. You know, at least this was my opinion about that, the subject. Like, I really need that interaction, that affection, and that love, you know. Not because I'm a needy person, but because we all need physical attachments to learn and grow and to feel loved and, and encouraged and supported. So listen deeply and take in what your partner is saying. That's number eight. Knowing that you're being heard is very nurturing. It's also the best way to heal old wounds and to prevent misunderstandings from occurring in the future. Paraphrasing what your partner has said is a great way to know that you are tuned in. So what I'm hearing you say is that it makes you feel unsafe when your boss says these words to you. That must be really scary for you. Have you have you thought to ask him? You know, like that. Those are kinds of words that you could say to your partner, right? Like if you're in that situation, obviously. So number nine, speak in a loving tone, and remember to smile at your partner. I mean, for me, the, there's two things every woman should wear: Chanel number five and a smile. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing Marilyn Monroe, of course, and you don't always have to wear Chanel number five. There's many other perfumes you could wear, but always smile at your partner. I mean, half of communication is tonal and a little more than half is visual. Speaking in a sincere and loving tone will let your loved one know that you're coming from a loving and caring place. 
And that's why you shouldn't ignore your partner. You should look at them. You know, if someone says something that's a little bit snarky or sarcastic, but they're smiling, then you could tell they're joking. But if you have your back turned to them because you're ignoring them, then you think that they're being hostile. I mean, verbal communication is one thing, but nonverbal is a lot more of the communication. Number 10, if your partner's having a rough time, pull out all the stops. Don't hold back and don't on your helping them and don't minimize their trouble. Having the person you love by your side when things are rocky is a true gift. So what it says here at the end of the article, emotional support is about helping to lift someone to higher ground so he or she can see their way through their difficulty. Having someone to rely on when the chips are down is one of the best parts of being in a relationship. Yeah, absolutely for sure. Like I'm looking for my ride or die. That person's going to be, be there, have my back, no matter what, you know, be there for me. Even if I'm on arguing on the side of wrong, you know, at that moment, you know, I want that person to always be there, always having my back. You know, that's what emotional support is. So, okay. I looked up, this is hilarious on wiki. How they literally, it says how to do anything. They literally have how to show support of somebody. So number one, ask the person what they want to do. If they need more emotional support, it's, they might have something that's an imbalance right now in their life. And so it's a great opportunity to help them explore what actions they can take to become emotionally centered again. So ask them how they want to fix this or, you know, maybe brainstorm together. Um, they might not know the answer and that's all right. Don't push for them to make a decision because that's not supportive and they just need to be validated first and heard and know that they're loved and you're going to have their back. So, all right, Charlie, I, I could see that you were fired. You told me you were fired. That's got to feel really hurtful to be rejected like that after you were at your job for seven years. I, I understand that. Is there anything else you want to share with me about the experience? You know, oh, I can hear that you, so you were friends with your boss and he fired you. So it's like double the pain because he, you feel like you also lost a friend. Well, what do you need me to do? Do you want me to, you know, stay the night with you or in and, and talk it out I'll be up all night with you you know encourage being loving ask what they want to do ask what if questions well okay so what if uh, there's a better job out there for you what if the company was going bankrupt and the boss was afraid to tell you what if your boss is dying and he's going to have to sell the business and he didn't want to hurt your feelings what if? I don't know. I don't know if that's supportive or not, but I mean, that would be me. That's what I would say. But what if questions do help the person to brainstorm possible action steps that they probably would have considered before. So, um, it's not threatening if you just say, what if like scenarios, it's just, what if this, what if that? And you, you want to support the person without stripping away their power. Give them suggestions and approach them in a gentle way so that they can come up with their own conclusions if they're going through something. Remember, you're not fixing the problem for the person. You're simply providing support to find the solution to the problem themselves. See, that's a problem I have. I always t- well, why don't you do this? <laughs> Unsolicited. Well, actually, it's usually solicited advice, but the person still doesn't like it. Yeah, maybe I'm learning something here, too. I'm an ideas person. I always have an idea, but all right. (laughs) So they say, for example, if your friend's struggling financially, say, well, what if you and your supervisor had a discussion about a pay raise? And they say, well, if your niece is feeling overwhelmed with work and home responsibilities, what if you plan to stress free vacation for your family? What if the what if question can be helpful to the other person? And they say, identify an action step. So, um, they might not have the answers Im- Im- uh, immediately, but just support the person by helping them take small steps to resolve 
the problem or the imbalance in their life. Identifying the next step is important. You know, so what's the next, what's your next plan? You know, you know, if your friend got fired, it'd be like, well, A, to get drunk and B, to take three days off and then C, to go look for another job. Well, there you go. Well, you know what to, you know how to do this. You got this. You got this. That Those are words of encouragement, but also to ask them. Hey, number three, show your support in tangible ways. It's, it's convenient to say things like, I'm here for you if you need me, or don't worry, it's all going to work out, instead of actually doing something to help. See, that's see that's where I have a problem when someone, like, they, they have the words down, but they don't have the actions to physically back up the words. I'll always be here for you. Okay, well, can you come over Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning? Well, no, I'm going to see my best girl then, or I'm going <laughs> to... No, I got bowling league. You're like, you can't skip it this week, you know? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, don't say you're going to always be here for me if I need you and then not be there for me when I do need you, right? <laughs> so it's actually important to show your support instead of just giving it lip service. After spending time actively listening to the person, you, you'll have an idea about specific things that you can do. So instead of saying everything will be fine, you can do everything in your power to make things better for the person. You know, help a sick friend uh, find a good medical specialist. You know, um, help research their treatment options if they have a disease that they need help with. In addition to saying I love you, do something for the person that you know that they will appreciate. Buy them a gift, spend more time with them, or take them somewhere special that will alleviate their stress. Instead of saying, I'm here for you, bring the person dinner, help with household tasks or something that they need to do in order to accomplish their action steps. You know, they have to clean their house and they have to look for a job. Well, maybe you could offer to clean their house while they look for a job. You know, maybe you offer to take them out to dinner so they don't have to spend an hour making dinner, you know, preparing it, eating it and cleaning up after it when they're too busy looking for a job, for example. Number four, follow up with them. So after, you know, you were there for them, maybe a week later or a few days later, you know, things could get hectic and maybe you didn't see them every day. You know what? Call them, text them, say, hey, how, how are you coming along with that? Is there anything else I can do? Be supportive. You know, they might have had a lot of verbal support, but the level of support will be deepened and they'll be appreciative of it so much more if you make time to help them and show small acts of kindness to them and actually be there for them in a way that other people aren't willing to do. That's how you can be supportive. So, all right, now the next thing here, I found a (laughs) terriblehusband.com. And all of our ex-husband's pictures are on this page. I'm just kidding. (laughs) It's like a who's who in the horrible world of divorce. No, it's not. Okay, a terriblehusband.com. Nine steps to becoming a supportive partner. <laughs> so this is pretty good. It's a funny, funny name for a website. So, um, he says one of the most common re- questions asked an, of relationship experts is what can I do to help keep the relationship vital and strong? An important part of the solution is providing emotional support that your partner craves. So read books, listen to experts, present information, and pay attention. This person, this man says, I have discovered nine different ways I can improve my ability to support my wife. He says these nine ways can form solid foundation upon which you can build a world-class relationship. And if you start applying these nine strategies in your relationship today, you'll be well on your way to becoming a truly supportive partner. And he says, it almost took me a decade to do seven and eight. So, you know, listen up, (laughs) basically. 
Number one, listen with intensity. When you listen, it shows you're interested in what's on your partner's mind. What do they love to do? What do they yearn for? You know, this, this person says, my wife's sister is profoundly deaf. Because of that, I have learned tips for paying attention. Look them in the face when they speak to you. That's rule number one. Yeah, and you know what? Honestly, have the TV off. Eliminate distractions. Shut off your cell phone. Go put in your dresser door and then come back into the room, right? You don't want to be like looking at people's selfies on Instagram when your husband or wife is trying to tell you something super important. So listen with intensity. And number two, think of your partner first as much as possible. What restaurant might they like to go to this evening? Is there an activity that they recently said they wished they could do? When you consider your partner's wants and their needs, your partner does feel the love. And he says, you'll never go wrong putting the needs and wants of someone you love before your own needs. After all, that's the very definition of love. A wise teacher once said, greater love has no man than he who lays down his life for another. I truly believe that he wasn't just talking about the end of someone's life, but also the end of someone's selfishness for another. I agree with this one. In my my um, 13 year marriage I told you guys before several times, 11 years were very happy and the last two years were terrible, but he had brain cancer and we didn't know. And so he was making some crazy accusations and goofy decisions and we didn't really know what was going on, but it, it got violent. I had to leave, but, um, brain cancer often does but uh, during those happy years he always anticipated when I was going to get up and he'd start my coffee I would always anticipate at night when he would be needing more tea and I would go make it for him I always knew you know Earl Grey at certain hours and then after that it would be like herbal tea without caffeine like We just knew each other so well, and it just became a natural habit to go out of your way for that person, even if it's uncomfortable, like snowing outside and it's cold, you don't want to get out from underneath the blanket you're cuddling under with them. But I'd get up anyway, and I'd go make them tea and bring back. You know, um, making him a snack when I knew he was hungry and he wasn't feeling good, you know, just always put your, your partner's needs before your own, you know, before your, you know, you don't think of your own comfort. You think of their well-being instead. It's super important. So think of your partner first as much as possible is number two in this article. Number three is laugh together each day. Every day have a good laugh. There's something comforting and fun about laughing easily and often. This article says, read them a joke or Tell them something funny that you read, you know, in the newspaper or heard on the radio, right? Use, um, he says, use a bit of self-deprecating humor. You don't always have to do that. If that's not your personality, don't do that. But find the humor in seemingly non-humorous happenings. He says, when my wife and I were dating, she complimented my sense of humor and ability to make her laugh. She was even more impressed when I told her that I thrive on the sound of laughter It's the most beautiful music anyone can create. Oh, that's sweet. Additionally, laughing with others provides a deep emotional connection with them that breaks down barriers. It's quite difficult to laugh with someone and then still be angry at them. Yeah, I agree with that too. My my, um, husband and I, we used to smoke weed together and watch Frasier. And we would laugh and laugh and laugh. And sometimes we'd get really goofy. We would smoke a lot of weed sometimes before the kids were born, for sure. We did that a lot more. And we would watch, um, we'd listen to Art Bell, and we'd play Trivial Pursuit, and we'd make fun of each other a little bit, like, gently, like, you know, like we couldn't remember, like, what we just asked, or we would couldn't remember the answer to something, and then we'd laugh really hard, or we'd make up really goofy um, answers if we didn't know the answer for real. And we just laughed and laughed and laughed. It was always fun. I mean, 
I don't know, a man that can make me laugh is sexier than anything else. You know, if a man has no sense of humor but a perfect body, I have no interest in him. I need a guy that's going to make me laugh. Like, that's so important. Having that emotional connection and that that humorous rapport, I really need that. You know, and a lot of people do too. It's very important, I think. So number four, pay attention. After living with someone for several years, he says uh, in this article, it's easy to fall into patterns of just doing your own thing and be more focused on your own desires. But observing your partner enhances your awareness of where they're at physically and emotionally. You know, um, I agree with that. You know, if they're walking a little slower or holding their back, pay attention to that. Like, hey, maybe we should go to the chiropractor together. Maybe I could give you um, a massage. You know? Be very aware of where they're at physically and emotionally. And he says to avoid the familiarity breeds contempt syndrome. Make it a point to learn something new about your partner every week. Turn it into a game. Saturday or Sunday morning when you're laying in bed together, discuss what's what it is that you've learned about the other person. And you'll be amazed what you find out about your partner and about yourself. I love that. That's a cute, that's a cute suggestion. Number five. Offer help frequently. If your wife seems frazzled about preparing for overnight visitors arriving next week, offer to help her prepare. Inquire about what she wants to have done and do some of the tasks for her. And if your husband wants to take his buddy to lunch next week and show off the new car but doesn't have the time to take it to the car wash, well, have it washed for him. Loving partners do assist each other frequently, so be on the lookout for things that you can do to help them. I agree with that. Making your partner's life easier, you know, um, without having, without them having to ask you, just start a load of laundry. It doesn't matter if it's usually the man in the relationship that does it, you do it. Or if it's usually the woman, you know, you do it. It doesn't matter. Usually that's your partner's job, but they're stressed this week. Do the laundry, do the laundry for them, you know, fold it, put it away for them. And they'll be so happy, like, oh my God, thank you. Let's, like, little things like that really can lead to great strides in the intimacy in your relationship. Number six, declare that you are a team. There will be opportunities to tell your spouse that you're there for them. So, hey, we're a team. You could count on me. That demonstrates ongoing support. Number seven, if you've been less than supportive recently, just bring it up. Like, look, I know I haven't been there for you lately, honey. This past week has been, you know, I've been in my head a little bit more. I haven't been paying attention the way I should have. And and I'm sorry. I I know that I wasn't there. I should have been. So I hope you can forgive me and I'm going to do better this week. I promise. And then follow up on the promise. Failure is not permanent. The failing to learn from that moment of failure is permanent. Number eight apologize when you've hurt your partner when you did something wrong you weren't there and you said you're going to be there or you just said something that was a little bit off the cuff and it hurt their feelings apologize from the heart sincere with sincerity be honest be humble and this can be a cleansing experience number nine this is the last one practice honesty always be honest with your partner Be careful with your tone of voice and gently portray your honest thoughts and feelings. This is how your relationship's going to thrive. And and, and part of the honesty is just being loyal to your partner in a way that you you imagine if you're about to do something that's going to hurt them, see it from their perspective. How would they see it? How would you see it if they did this to you? That would, that will, if you, if you put yourself in their shoes and you see it from their perspective, Every single time you're going to know what the right thing is to do in any given situation. If you don't call home and you go out with your buddies drinking, that's going to hurt their feelings, right? So be honest all the time. I need a night out with the guys. Okay. Or I need a night out with the girls. All right. Honesty is um, extremely important. We all need to learn to tell the truth when it comes to love relationships. 
when you have love in your heart and you make sure that you're not going to, um, you know, if you lie, then that's just a slippery slope. It could just get worse and worse and worse. Always be honest. Don't be afraid of the fight. If your honesty is going to cause something, that's okay. You know, Elton John says Saturday night's all right for fighting. Get a little action in. (laughs) If you know it's going to be a fight. All right. Well, let's have dinner first. (laughs) We'll start the fight at seven o'clock after we've digested our food for a couple hours. All right, let's do it. All right. You want this and I want that. Well, let's be honest. Talk about be honest, but don't judge the other person harshly. You know, remember this song, honesty is such a lonely word. Everyone is so untrue. Honesty is hardly ever heard, but mostly what I need from you. Everybody needs to hear the truth. Don't be hard when you tell someone the truth that might hurt them, because sometimes the truth hurts, but be honest. Be honest. Whether it's like, you know, honey, that haircut, it's not doing the best (laughs) for you right now. So let's figure out something else. Let's figure out something else, you know, until it grows out. Here's a scarf. (laughs) You know, or honestly, I need more communication from you. Honestly, I need you to support me more, but let me explain to you in what ways I need that support. I don't need you to say you're here for me, but then you never do the laundry or you forget to pick up the dry cleaning or whatever. I need you to do the lawn when you say you're going to mow the lawn. The neighbor, the neighbors are complaining (laughs) or whatever the thing is. There's all kinds of things, but just be honest with them always to be perfectly honest with you I see your flaws but I love you anyway and I would not want to fight with anyone else on this earth but you even though we're fighting right now I'm so happy we're together doing it those are the kinds of things that can make a person feel loved and supported even if it's in the middle of a fight So honesty is always the best policy. Just be kind. Just be gentle. Be loving and supportive. Hang in there. You'll, you'll, you'll get it. You've got this. I'm your ride or die. We'll get through this together. These are all words you can use to support your loved one. So anyway, I hope that this helped you, um, help yourself to a much better more loving and happy relationship and a happier life. Thank you guys. I do love you guys so much. Thank you for your love, your loyalty and support for sharing this with other people in your life. Thank you for liking, subscribing, favoriting, whatever, what have you sharing this with your Facebook groups and with your friends and family and your mailing lists. Thank you for promoting metaphysical soul speak. I'm really seeing the difference and I'm really grateful for it. And I appreciate you. So I will be back tomorrow, just like always with all unique and original programming. But right now I'm signing off with peace and joy and the high vibes of the Holy fifth dimension until next time, guys, peace. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you.